be learning a lot about asynchronous JavaScript in preparing for this talk. Uh, I've been reading a book just called Code about how software interacts with computers at the hardware level. Um, I'm learning a little bit about uh, how relays and later transistors can be cobbled together into things like logic gates. I think it's really interesting. So just a fun thing I'm learning. But anyway, uh, hi, again, I am Corey Smith. And the first thing you should know about me is that I am not a developer. Uh, I do work for Kroger. I'm actually a product manager there. Um, on the SEO team, I work with Michael Richardson and Danny McAvey. Um, but I'm really, really interested in software engineering. And I've been learning a lot about JavaScript in my spare time and some at work. Um, I'm telling you this because after this talk, I'm sure some of you are gonna have questions about the things I'm about to show you. And there is a moderate to good chance that I will not have the answers um, because you are all undoubtedly more experienced than I am. So I can't promise I will have answers to your questions, but I do promise that I will try to find out and get back to you later. Um, and lastly, I was not able to use PowerPoint animations in this talk. Uh, I wrote the whole talk in Markdown uh, using a tool called MARP. And when it converted the talk to PowerPoint, I guess it just made images. I was hoping to have those three bullet points just slide in all smoothly, uh, but that's not happening. So instead, you are going to see a lot and a lot of slides. I am sorry about that. Uh, and I wanted to give a disclaimer that I'm going to show you a lot of code. Um, and particularly as it relates to the promise code, I want to make clear that a lot of this code is not mine. I cobbled together this talk from a lot of resources where people do similar things. That's uh, building promises from scratch for learning purposes. And I really don't want to pass off this code as my own. So, so know that. Um, one resource that I used especially heavily is a video called uh, Coding Promises from Scratch in Vanilla JavaScript by a channel called Low Level JavaScript. I can share that out later, but just so you all know. And now we can get into it. Um, so in this talk, we are going to build a mostly working prom promise implementation in Vanilla JavaScript. Uh, before we do that, there's a little bit of background I need to go into. Um, for example, what is a promise? Uh, according to the spec that defines JavaScript promises, a promise is an abstraction that represents the eventual result of an asynchronous oper operation. Asynchronous being anything that takes some amount of time. Promises were created to replace callbacks. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what callbacks are, but I prepared a small demonstration just so we're all on the same page. So here I've written two JavaScript functions. The first one prints out one after 500 milliseconds, and the second prints two after no time. So when we run both of those functions in sequence, even though we executed print one first, two actually is what gets logged out first, and then one. And that's fairly obvious because print two had no delay, print one had a delay of 500 milliseconds, so it took 500 milliseconds for one to get logged out. Uh, but what if we wanted to make sure that print two never ever ran until print one completed? Uh, the answer to that question would be a callback. So I rewrote print one to include a callback, which it takes as an argument. And this time we wait for 500 milliseconds, log out one, and then run the callback, whatever it is. And in this case, we want the callback to be uh, the print two function. So we go ahead and run print one with callback with print two as an argument. And what do we see? One and then two log, just like we like. So promises came around to replace this functionality. A promise does more or less the exact same thing as a callback. It just does it in a different way. So I rewrote a return one instead of log one to use a promise. And what it does is basically the same thing. It waits 500 milliseconds and then it resolves to the value one. And what you can do then, and I'll get more into how this all works in a little bit, um, is you can access that return value a little later and do whatever you want with it. And in this case, I logged it out with the number two and you can see that both happened on the same line. Now, you might be thinking, Corey, 
callbacks and promises look to be about as complicated as each other. And I agree with you. The thing is, the more asynchronous operations you get to, the more unwieldy callbacks get. By comparison, if you want to execute multiple promises in a row, it is as simple as adding another dot then method to the end of it. So if we wanted to get the return value of that first promise, log it out, and then do something else, it's really, really simple. Um, by the way, this works because whenever you call dot then, another promise is returned. And if this doesn't make sense right now, don't worry because we are going to go into all of this in way greater depth. Now, before we actually start building our promise implementation, there's a few things we need to know about promises. One, promises exist in one of three states. They can either be pending, which means they haven't finished doing whatever they're doing. They can be fulfilled, which means they finished doing what they were doing and they succeeded, or they can be rejected, which means they failed somewhere along the way. Two, once it's settled, um, and by settled I mean fulfilled or rejected, a promise's value can never change. It is immutable. Nothing you do can ever affect the value of a promise once it has settled. Three, all promises have a then method that allows you to access its eventual value or reason. By the way, value is what we call the return value of a promise when that promise succeeds, and reason is what we call the value of a promise when that promise fails. Um, and I hope it's obvious by this point, but whenever you have code in a then statement, it will never do anything until the promise that it was called on settles. And four, like I already said, promise.then always returns another promise. And this is important because it enables promise chaining. So now that I have given you all of these guidelines, let's look at some code. We are going to call our promise implementation promise. Um, I named it with a K because I wanted it to stand for Cory promise. The more I looked at it, the more I thought that Kroger promise seems like a more appropriate reading. It really doesn't matter. Think whatever you like. So we've got our class and that class will take a constructor that is an executor function. So if you remember the promises I built before, all promises take a function and that function is whatever you want to do that is asynchronous. Now, the executor function itself takes two arguments, but we're gonna get to that a little later. So before we do anything with that function, we want to initialize some private variables. All promises start their lives as pending, and that makes sense because at this point, we haven't done anything with the function we passed to the promise. We want to add a place for the value to be stored when it is resolved. And we want to add a place for the reason to be stored uh, if the promise fails. Now, things will get a little tricky right here. Um, so I mentioned earlier that promises had the ability to be chained. That means you can call then, and then dot then, and then dot then. And this is handled to, through something we'll call the then queue that we will represent as an array. We're just gonna put that there. We're going to ignore it until a little later. So now we've got all of our skeletons and we want to start working on that executor function. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the executor function is actually a function. If it's not, then we just don't do anything. The promise will just stay empty forever. But if it is a function, we're going to try to run it. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the executor function itself takes two arguments. Um, those arguments are typically resolve and reject and they handle the case where if the promise succeeds, here's the value you want it to have. And if the promise fails, here's the value you want it to have. Um, so those two arguments actually map to private methods of the promise class. And I know that that's confusing. We will get to that later. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to run the executor function. And if it succeeds, we want to call on fulfilled, which we'll write later. If it fails, we'll want to call on rejected. And you'll notice that there is a bind method used here. That really, really confused me at first. So I'm going to explain what this does. 
So when you bind a function to this, what you really do is you create a new function where the this of that function, this is hard to say, but where the this of that function is the same as the this where it was created. So to, to, to say that in more plain English, what we do when we bind these functions is we ensure that when we run that executor function, the scope of that function is exactly the same as the scope where the promise was initially created. So it's possible that this executor function itself might throw an error. So we manage that by putting the execution of that executor function inside of a catch try block. Uh, we'll deal with the catch later. Um, and this ensures that if the executor function messes up, that that error doesn't get swallowed and we can get a pretty nice error handling. So uh, we're good now, right? Well, we are not quite good. The specification of promises say that unfulfilled or unrejected must not be called until the execution context stack contains only platform code. Now, what this means is that we should never call unfulfilled or unrejected until the call stack contains only platform code. Excuse me. And what that means is that we should delay executing that executor function until the event loop has gone an entire cycle around. Um, and a really easy way to do that would be to set that catch try block inside of a timeout of zero. Now, you might be looking at the set timeout of zero and think, what does it matter if you set a timeout to zero? Isn't a delay of zero not a delay at all? So let me show you what happens here. So we are going to bring back our first and second functions. The first function logs out one after a delay of zero, and the second function logs out two after no delay. So you would expect here that the output would be one, two, right? Uh, it's not. The output is actually two and then one. And that's because set timeout, no matter how long the delay is, delays whatever function is inside of it until at least one cycle of the event, no matter what the timeout actually is. So that is why the set timeout of zero does exactly what the spec recommends. So with that, we have successfully handled the creation of our constructor function minus the catch. And then what I have right here is a little skeleton of the methods that remain for us to code. So we've got then, we've got catch, which handles errors. And then we have those private unfulfilled and unrejected function, which again, map to the resolve and reject functions of that executor function. I know I'm saying function a lot. Thank you all for bearing with me. So first, I think we should handle that unfulfilled. So when the resolve function of the created promise is called, what we're actually calling is the private unfulfilled function. So what happens here is actually pretty simple. When the promise is fulfilled, we want to change the state of that promise from pending to fulfilled. We want to update the value of that promise to whatever value was returned from the resolve function. And then we are going to do something weird. Uh, we're going to call a function that we'll write later that's called propagate fulfilled. And what that does is it's going to inform any promises down the then chain that the value of this promise has, has um, settled and what that value is. And, and don't worry, we'll get to that in a little bit. However, all of these things I just laid out, we actually only want to do if the state of the promise is pending. Remember what I said, you absolutely cannot change the value of a function if it's already settled. So we only want to do this if the promise is currently pending. And if it's not, we'll just do nothing. So with that, we have taken care of unfulfilled. Um, unrejected is more or less the exact same thing, except instead of a value, there's a reason. The state is now rejected, and we want to propagate rejected, which does the same thing. It just informs any promises down the chain that our promise failed and why it failed. So we'll add a little check mark there. Next, we're going to handle the then function. And this is really the most important part of the promise interface. This will take us a little while, so let's go step through step. Anytime you call then, you have the option of two arguments. 
you have a fulfilled function and you have a catch function. Fulfilled handles um, what you want to do with the previous promise in the case that it succeeded, catch handles the case of failure. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new promise that doesn't have an executor function. Remember what I said, then always returns another promise. Well, this control promise is what we're going to return from them. Um, and we call it control promise because since we didn't give it an executor function, we as the class creators are in total control of when that promise resolves or rejects and how it resolves or rejects. So until we do something, that control promise is going to be pending forever. At this point, we are also going to start taking advantage of the then queue. So inside the then queue, we're going to push a destructured array of the control promise, which remember is completely empty at this point, the fulfilled function and the catch function. And we'll get to that a little later. So to update the value of control promise, the promise that dot then is being called on has to be settled. However, by the time we actually get to executing promise dot then, it might be that the parent promise is actually settled. So we can check for that. So we'll say, if the promise is fulfilled, then let everybody else know. If the promise is rejected, let everybody else know. Otherwise, return the controlled promise. And that part really confused me for a while. But what that does is it basically just says, wait until things are actually fulfilled or rejected. We eventually come back down to this fulfilled rejected check and everything works out. So that is what our then method looks like. Um, so you might have noticed at this point that I've been talking a lot about these propagate functions, the propagate fulfilled, propagate rejected, um, and we're going to start working on those so you can see how, they're work, how, how they work. Now, these are really important, and the sole purpose of these methods is to communicate the state of the previous promise to all the other promises in the event queue. Uh, in other words, if then is never called, if there's no then queue, um, then this function does nothing, or the, sorry, this method does nothing. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take a look at the then queue, and for each entry in the then queue, and remember, then queue is an array of arrays, we are going to destructure the control promise and the unfulfilled function. In the beginning, when we call propagate fulfilled, uh, the first thing we want to do is actually to ensure that the fulfilled function, and I'll take a step back here and say, remember, the unfulfilled function is whatever is in then, and I'll, I'll show that in just a second. So we want to check that it actually is a function, and if it is a function, then we grab the value that is returned by running the parent promises value through that fulfillment function. And I'm about to show you how this looks. It, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Um, so there we go. Um, I want to show you what this actually looks like. So we have one promise here, and it's just a promise that resolves to one. So one promises value is one. And when we call dot then, we want to take that value, that value being one, and we want to run a fulfilled function on it and transform the value. So when we call dot then, the promise that dot then returns has a value of two. Um, and this is amazing because when we do that, we haven't actually modified the value of one promise. We've created a new promise, modified its value, and returned that. So I hope that helps to clear things up a little bit. Um, so we have a value or we have a promise. And the next thing we want to do is we want to check to see if value or promise is actually a value or a promise. And there are so many different ways we could do this. The spec recommends a really laid back way. And that is to just check that, um, that value or promise has a then method and that that then method is a function. And if it is, we're just going to assume it's a promise and we're going to treat it like a promise. So back to our promise class. 
so the first case is that value or promise is a promise. And if that happens, then we just call the then method on that promise. The second case is that value or promise is a value. And if that happens, we set our control promises value to whatever that value is. Um, and there's a blank slide here and I don't know why, sorry about that. The final case is that value or function is undefined and in, oh, sorry. And in that case, the spec just says that we should give the control promise the value of, of the promise we have and that's what we'll do. And finally, we clear out the then queue so that no further then calls can update the promises we've already dealt with. Um, so with that, we actually have a pretty, what's pretty close to a working promise implementation. Um, we haven't handled anything to do with rejections, um, but it turns out that rejections are really, really similar to resolutions. And so I'm gonna kind of breeze through them. So let's go ahead and write catch. Uh, catch takes one argument, that's a catch function, and catch is actually just a special case of this. So you'll recall, I'm sorry, <laughs> catch is actually just a special case of then. Um, so you'll recall that then actually takes a fulfilled function and a rejected function. So when someone calls catch, we actually just call this with the first argument, that's the fulfilled function, as null, and everything's good. And there's also a propagate rejected. And I'm not going to go through this one line by line. Basically, the only thing that's different is when we get to value or promise, if that is actually a value, we call not on rejected, but on fulfilled. And we do this because the job of catch statements is to take a sort of illegal JavaScript value and to turn it back into something normal. So. That's what happens there. And actually, after we've done that, we have built a promise class. Um, this class, I know it doesn't have a finally method, but it will behave almost exactly like a regular promise. And at this point, I'm sure you're wondering, does that work? Is it gonna work? And I am gonna show you. So we'll go ahead and kill our PowerPoint window. Uh, can you all see my terminal? I'm seeing nods, excellent. Um, I should make this a little smaller. So in this file right here, I have more or less what I've just showed you. There are a few differences, but um, this is the promise class that we just built. And we're actually going to run it through a test to see if it will do what we expect it to do. And that's handled right here. So what we're going to do, I'll explain it before I walk you through it, is we are going to read the contents of this very file and after a delay of two seconds, we're going to replace all the vowels with nothing. We're gonna kill all the vowels. After that's done, we're going to print out the first 200 characters of the file. And if there's any error, we're gonna catch it at the end here and log it out. So we've got the file here. And what should happen if I type node promise.js is some time should pass and we should log out the first 200 lines of this file without any vowels. So let's see. So there's the characters. And would you look at that there? Oh, that's interesting, pending. So, so some of the vowels weren't replaced, but you can see there's a bunch of what looks like nonsense here. So that means it worked. Uh, but what happens if an error happens? So what if I tell it to, um, to modify the vowels of, of crow.js, which is a file that doesn't exist. You can see that the error is actually handled properly. So there are a few nuances to the actual promise class that we didn't cover. For example, promises have a dot all method. They also have a dot finally, which does a very similar thing to the finally in a try catch statement. Um, and another thing is that at this point in time, promises are actually handled in the JavaScript engine of a lot of the browsers. So the promise class isn't written in JavaScript, it's written in a lower level language like C++ or whatever. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting way 
for everybody to, to take an abstraction that we're all familiar with and that we all use all the time and to really break it apart. Um, and so actually, that is my talk. I want to thank you all. And I would love to open up the floor to questions um, with the disclaimer that I very well may not know the answer to them. Uh, one comment, uh, Mozilla out there for Promise has a really good explanation to it. So uh, if you really, if you get confused, which you always do at the beginning, uh, that's a good place to go to get it sorted out in your head. Are you referring uh, to MDN? Yeah. Okay. I'm a big fan of MDN. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost miraculous how clear they make things. They're, they're magical. I agree. If I recall correctly, those are, uh, it's essentially a wiki, correct? So anyone can contribute to MDN, which definitely helps in that case. True, true. Uh, this is really, really helpful. You use promises all the time on node.js. Uh, that's the only way you can get through it. And that's the real value of node is asynchronous execution. Oh, I completely agree. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll stop sharing now and you can all just talk. I see some, I see some things in the chat. Yeah, Corey, I can, I can speak to that. So um, I just threw that in there and I, I want to just appreciate and compliment you on your handling of these foundational principles in JavaScript, because it, there's a lot that went into that. And I thought it might be helpful for people to have just some structure of things they might want to look into if they found parts of it confusing. Um, because because it, you covered a ton of ground and I thought you did it in a really great way and, I, and one of the things I love about about going over uh, plain JavaScript like foundational issues in JavaScript just like I say in the comment it, that will apply in any context where you're using JavaScript like there's it doesn't matter if you're on a React project an Angular project working in Node whatever um, these things are really important so thank you and I, I put a link to uh, a good resource you don't know JS. Uh, because it's uh, that's that's something that I've read parts of and found really really good. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of you don't know JS, so th that's a wonderful resource. Thank you so much. Yeah, Corey, uh, definitely thank you. That that was uh, a really good explanation of promises. Um, I feel like it would be really valuable to share with anybody who's uh, encountering the concept for the first time. Uh, yeah, and with your permission, a little later on, maybe we can uh, make this video public and people can actually use it to better understand promises because I think it would really one of the better resources that I've seen. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to. I will go ahead and I'll um, I'll publish the the promise um, repository to my GitHub and we can share that out too if anyone just wants to play around with it. Um, and again, I want to say that a lot of this code and a lot of these ideas came from the low level JavaScript YouTube channel. So definitely check that out, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, people got something out of it. Can I ask my Angular question? Oh, about yeah. uh, client-side rendering? Uh, yeah. Before you do, uh, just if last chance for anyone with if it's specific to the promises talk because if there aren't any of those then I will go ahead and stop recording. All right, cool. I'll do that. <laughs>